Welcome to number five. I think it's number five, isn't it's it? It's number five. It is. It's number five. five. Number five. It's been a journey. We never thought we'd get there. But we <laughs> are taking you down the journey, telling you what you need to know, uh, exploring the unknowns and the unknown unknowns, and hopefully opening up your eyes as to how to grow your business with systems, with marketing, with a method to the madness. And I've brought in here none other than uh, Alison Warner, coach, speaker, author extraordinaire of Evolve and Grow for session, trades acceleration session number five. This is all about hiring a team, right? We need people. Nobody can grow a business alone. And we need people and networks uh, and leverage to be successful. And it is such a challenge. I wish I could solve this challenge for our clients, um, but recruitment, hiring a team, finding the right people. And Allison, thank you so much for joining us because you're gonna dispel some myths I know, <laughs> and really help people with this massive problem in the in the industry right now. So, Allison, I'll leave it to you to take us through uh, this journey. Thank you very much, Francis. Yeah, absolutely. So, I'll just get my pink magic wand out from under the uh, desk yes. <laughs> and wave it, wave it away. So, um, up until now, in the trade accelerator sessions, we've looked at uh, how to. Uh, market your business successfully, how to increase leads, how to manage those leads. In the session a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at time management. So how to kind of move um, from a position where you're perhaps on the tools all of the time to, to coming off gradually and, and how your role might change. And But tonight's is all about recruitment. And so the number of people that I speak to, I'm sure you do too, Francis, where um, this is a pain point in the business in terms of how do I find good people that will stay with me, that will do what I expect and perform well and be reliable and represent my company in the way that, you know, I would. Yeah. It's a, and it's a challenge, I think, for any business, but even more so, I think, for construction and trades. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm going to take um, us through are basically some tried and, and tested techniques. My background um, is working for companies like Starbucks and, and Pizza Hut. And this process is effectively what I implemented at, at Starbucks and also Pizza Express to a, a certain degree, but adapted it for this industry. Um, and so let's get straight into it. So the, where I'd like to start for anybody that's joining us on the, the call this evening, either via Zoom or in the Facebook Live, I'd like you to think, first of all, before you even think about posting an ad or asking around your network, just take a step back for a moment and think about what your offering is um, to potential employees. So it's almost like in the same way that you would think about this naturally to a paying client, it's applying the same philosophy, but to what I call your internal customer. So you've got your external paying customer Anybody that works with you, whether it's an employee or a subcontractor, effectively, they are also a customer of yours. They are your internal customer and they are representing your brand each and every day. And so the first thing is really think about, right, how attractive is it to come and work for me? And this isn't just about the money. It's not about just paying lots of money, you know, um, it could be lots of different things that make your company attractive. And a good starting point would be anybody who's been with you for a significant length of time. So I would say maybe three years plus anybody who's been with you around that length of time, there's a reason why they're staying with you. Cause I think to stay three years with one employer is quite rare nowadays. So go and have a chat with them and just find out, you know, what they enjoy about working with you they'll probably have some things that they could they say that you could do better or the company could do um, but find out you know why is it that they stay with you a big one I hear in this industry is will you pay me on time that's actually you know it's a basic it's a simple and certainly working in corporate land you would expect that as a basic but 
you know if you are doing that then um you you know you need to market that you need to say look we we pay our people on time we know this is important to you and this is something that we do so that's something you can do very quickly go and ask people what is it that attracts you to and, and um, make you stay with us you know what is it that we're doing so it's this whole um kind of mindset of remember recruitment is a two-way process it's not just about um whether they're right for you it's also about whether you're right for them and as i say if you've got people who've stayed with you a significant length of time you're doing something right find out what it is but also what could you do in addition to that so, you know, best practice that I see amongst our client base are things like sitting down with each of their um, staff, either contractors or employees, maybe for half an hour, just half an hour in the cafe, taking them for breakfast once every four weeks, six weeks, taking them for a beer at the end of the, the night and just finding out, you know, what's going well, what could be better and giving them some feedback. That's a big driver of engagement is do people understand what's expected of them and how they're doing against that? So it's in a corporate land, we'd call it a one-to-one. -one. You can also call it, call it a one-to-one, -one, but it's a get-together. It doesn't have to be anything too formal, um, but it's just spending time one-on-one -on -one with your people. Other things I see that work really, really well are team socials. Um, so getting the whole team together, uh, maybe once a quarter and going out for a meal or going out for a few drinks. You know, people then relax and you get to know them as people. And they get to start to feel part of something and part of a bigger team. And they build stronger relationships with each other. They're far more likely um, to stay with you. And again, it's bringing those sorts of elements into um, recruitment, whether it's in the advert or whether you explain it to them on social media, you know, that this is what makes us different. These are some things that we do. And believe me, they will be different. Um, so to show that you invest in your people and you care about your people, then you can look at, you know, when you've got a certain number of employees, um, benefits and things like that. But don't underestimate how important the other aspects are around retention. You know, yes, we all want to be paid more, but we don't want to work in a place where we're not respected and we're not asked for our opinion and, and things like that. So that's step one. Step two is then articulating all of that in a compelling job advert. So what I often see in this industry is um, people panic hiring. So they realize they desperately need somebody or somebody leaves and it's like, oh my God, I need somebody desperately. And they start asking around and somebody says, oh, well, I know so-and-so is looking for a job and, and you meet with them or maybe you just put them straight onto the tools and sometimes it works out, but often it doesn't. So what we're really wanting to do at this stage is to widen the net. We want to put a compelling job advert together that sells the company um, and we want to get it everywhere. So um, advertising on all job boards for a start. We um, partner with a company called Hiring People, which effectively buy advertising space on the job boards at a fraction of the cost of what you would pay if you went there directly so for 195 pounds you can get on all of the job boards for four weeks it's a bit of a non-brainer no brainer in addition to that all of the applications come into a piece of software called an applicant tracking um, mm -hmm. uh, software which... is, that, is that specific to this industry this recruitment process that you're no, is it interesting no. widely um, hiring people work with all sorts of industries, mm -hmm. um, but you know what you don't want is if you were to advertise, for example, um, for an office manager tomorrow, in the current climate, you probably would get 1,500 to 2,000 applications. Mm -hmm. Now, you can imagine if you haven't got um, that piece of kit in place, that's going to be painful. <laughs> mm -hmm. All of those applications are going to be arriving in your inbox and it will be an absolute nightmare. So with a, um, an applicant um, tracking um, piece of software, uh, it helps organize all of that, those applications so you can view the CVs very quickly and you can just tick whether or not they're, they're right. And I would say if you're advertising for an administrative position, outsource it, get some help from a VA or um someone to do that heavy lifting for you because you won't have the time if you're recruiting for a trade position in the current climate it's the opposite so it's very very challenging to find good trades people at the moment yeah. you might only be looking at 15 or 20 applications so you can generally manage it yourself and we tend to say to clients 
um, do it yourself if it's a trade position because you know what you're looking for and then we just provide the, the tools that I'm going to go Why do you think it's particularly hard right now to find good tradespeople, talent, skills, you know, good employees? Yeah, because generally construction is booming at the moment. So, you know, we've, we're coming out of the pandemic, but we're not able to travel and go on holiday. Um, some people have, have saved up some money during that time. They can't go on holiday. Um, and so it's a case of, you know, I, I'm doing it myself here. It's like, oh, well, I might as well do some home improvements. <laughs> if I'm not going on holiday, <laughs> I will have that new kitchen. Um, right. So, yeah, it's absolutely our, our builder clients at the moment are it's crazy that some of them are getting 10 inquiries a day for mm -hmm. um, extensions and, and such like. Um, so it is, yeah, even more, more challenging. Uh, but I would also put that advert in, on social media. So um, Facebook, uh, Instagram, you're obviously limited, aren't you, in terms of what you can put, but you can still put a brief um, summary of the role and then send them through a link to, to somewhere else. Um, ask around. So I'm not saying don't ask around. I'm just saying, you know, have other channels that are bringing in applicants um, and you give them the link to that advert. So everyone, again, is coming into this um, applicant tracking system. It's a great idea um, to use your existing team. And I think there's a difference between asking around, oh, do you know anyone? And putting a little bit of money behind it. So, yeah. you know, um, if you're to say, look, for the month of June, we're offering um, £500 to anybody who finds somebody who stays with us and performs for three months, that's perhaps, you know, they're going to take a little bit more time to think about who they know. And they're mm -hmm. only going to refer people who, who are, are good. So mm -hmm. that can really work well as a refer a friend um, right. scheme. If you're a member of a local networking group, that's also a great source of um, candidates. Uh, so uh, rather than ask for, for customers and more business, you know, it's often people the, to, to do the business. That's what um, clients need. So um, you, tapping into their networks is, uh, is a great way as well. And then uh, perhaps this isn't a quick fix, but you know, having a careers page on your website that actually sells the opportunity and sells the company and explains you know, how you treat people and the culture that you've got is also a great um, thing because if you are doing any advertising, people are gonna go and check out your company. And if there's a careers page on there, straight away, you know, it's a rare thing for a trade business to have a, a careers page. Yeah, very, um, very, yeah. Makes you, makes you stand out, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, step four is then to have a selection process. So if you can imagine, you can have all these applications. And I think it's a different process if you're recruiting for an administrative person slightly to a trade person. So I will cover both. But the idea is that you've got some kind of process to filter them down. What you don't want to be doing is meeting with 20 people face to face, interviewing them. That's not smart, effective recruitment. That's not a good use of your time. Um, you must, must move quickly, um, especially if it's a trade position. Um, so good people get snapped up very, very quickly, even more so with trade positions. So if you're looking for, a, I don't know, a multi-trade or um, electrician, painter and decorator, carpenter, anything like that, you want to be checking that system every day. And anybody that looks good, move them to the next stage, which I'll come on to in a moment. In terms of the screening, what the sorts of things that you should be looking for might sound obvious, but I'll say it anyway. Um, first of all, do they have transferable skills? So, for example, there may have been an office manager in a different um, type of firm, but it's another trade firm. Well, those skills are easily transferable. Do they have the necessary qualifications? So obviously, if you're looking for, a, say, a heating engineer, um, they, you know, they need to be qualified. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next one is is really looking to see how likely are they to stay with you. So I would be looking for how long they've stayed in various positions and are there gaps between those positions? Because that can be a telltale sign that they don't settle and there's a reason why they're moving on. It, you know, don't totally discount them. I would if, if somebody's done that for, say, 10 years, job what we call job hopped. 
probably not a great idea to take them forward. But if there's just a few times, you know, there could be a, a valid reason for it. So don't assume um, anything negative, but you certainly want to be checking that out at the next stage, which is the telephone interview. So what I would do is I'd shortlist the top 10 for a telephone interview. This can save you considerable amounts of time um, because within 10 to 15 minutes, you'll have a pretty good understanding of um, whether or not they are um, somebody that you want to meet face to face. Um, and I'll go back. So this is a series of questions, things such as um, tell me about the job that you're doing at the moment. What do you really enjoy about it? What don't you enjoy? What's um, prompted you to apply? what's important to you what's most important to you about the next job that you do um, all of those sorts of questions will give you a an indication of um, you know how keen are they and ideally you want somebody who is passionate about what they do and isn't just doing it because they need a job um, and you can kind of get a pretty good feeling for that on a telephone interview um, and then the next stage is a behavioral interview so this is uh, where you meet with them face to face and you're asking them to talk you through and give you examples of situations that they've been in. So if this was a trade position, um, I would be asking maybe tell me about, you know, a, a really tricky customer that you had. What was tricky about them? How did you handle it? Um, tell me about a job that you were working on where you fit, you, you hit a, a certain obstacle. You know, what was it? How did you approach it? What did you do? It's um, those types of questions as opposed to tell me what you would do if you were in this situation because most of us know what we should be doing but it's what you actually have done in the past that we're interested in because past behavior is the best predictor of yeah. future behavior so just by asking you know these sorts of questions can give you a really good indication of whether or not the person is right for you i would also say if it's a trade position there's nothing wrong with bringing them out with you for the day I would pay them um, and seeing them actually working on the tools really really important because these sorts of interviews they check for the attitude and reliability but it doesn't mean to say that they've got the skill level so you want to yeah. see them actually working um, I would come across this frequently with heating engineers I don't know why but often the, the heating engineer applicant says they can do something maybe they think they can but then when they actually in reality get onto the job, maybe they haven't been trained properly, I don't know, but often it's a very different story and they, they actually aren't doing things to standards. So it's very worthwhile to have some kind of practical element to your- Can I ask a, a quick question about that? Of course you can, yeah. So in trying out the candidate or um, on the day, I mean, how does that work in practice? You know, they don't have the job yet um do you pay them for their time on the job or, or do you so, is this a test are they uh, i would a probationary I, yeah. period how does that yeah work? it's it's interesting because actually in the states it's illegal not to um it's what we call an on-the-job evaluation and we used to do it a lot in hospitality and they used to come in for i think two hours and work a shift in a coffee shop or something they didn't get paid it was part of the selection process but um, I would say it's best practice to pay them because from an insurance perspective, I, I'm not too sure how I'm guessing that they wouldn't be covered if, you know, because this work is, is slightly riskier than, say, wiping a, a, a table clean. <laughs> there's still a risk, as opposed to that. But um, in this environment, um, there's far more risk. And so from an insurance perspective, I'd want to make sure that they're, they're getting paid. Do you, in your experience, do you say, do you see that this is a practice that most businesses do or very few businesses do? Um, I would say those that have had their fingers burnt do it through mm -hmm. experience. So yeah. maybe uh, to begin with, they, they don't. Mm -hmm. And then they learn the hard way that, oh, actually, little Johnny said he could do X, Y, Z, but it was yeah. a disaster. He, he just couldn't or she um so uh yeah i know quite a few people who who do um it might not be the business owner that is taking them out for the day they might put them with their best 
trades person and say right i want you to spend a day and with them you know see what you think it's good to have other people's opinion you know, yeah get other people involved in the process especially if you want to get buy-in from the team as well um so you know that's something that pret used to do they may still do there was a team vote very very powerful so it was actually the team that decided whether or not that person was hired not the the manager of the store very very powerful to hand that over to the team because the team will tell you if they're any good <laughs> yeah so um yeah yeah so that's the behavioral interview um and then the last check step which is so so important is to check references so often what you find and this is across the board it's not just this industry people are so pleased that they think they found you know the the perfect person that they relax at this point they're like, oh right vacancy filled great um you must, must, must check references because some people are just great at being interviewed and selling themselves. Um, even if it's a subcontractor, I'd be asking for two recent clients that I could contact and ask about their work. Really, really important. Um, and I'd be doing it over the phone because uh, people would tell you more over the phone and you'll also get a sense, you know, if they're not very forthcoming with information, then you'll, you'll get a sense that maybe they're not the right person. And the second element is to plan for their induction. So don't just throw them in on day one and, and um, you know, actually think about that first day and how that person might be feeling. You know, they're probably a bit nervous. Um, one of my clients, uh, they, they have a um, plantation shutters company. They do an amazing first day for their new employees where it's all about, they talk to them about the culture and the values of the company they then go and visit the warehouse. They spend time with the warehouse manager. They go and meet the team in the office. So they have a full induction, welcoming them, welcoming them into the company. It's not like, right, here's, yeah. <laughs> you know, here's a spade, go, go and start. You know, the first day is all about welcoming them. I'm struggling to say that word, <laughs> welcoming them <laughs> into the organization. And, and so they can understand the bigger picture and how they fit into that as well. Um, and uh, no surprise, you know, they then um, start off on the right foot and that person feels welcomed and is more likely to perform and stay with them. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's the last slide. Yeah, that's step five. So, that's yeah, I know we've kind of been discussing things as we've been going through there, Francis. Um, mm -hmm. No, that's great. Thank you so much. And I think that, you know, this is going to be of tremendous value to people because, yeah, you know, this comes up again and again and again in the Facebook communities and the chat rooms and stuff yeah. like that. It, it's when we ask, because we ask people all the time, what is your biggest challenge? And I would say that 50% of the answers are marketing related and 50% yeah. are people recruitment and team related. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know. It's. I mean, it's not a. You know, I used to say to my managers at Starbucks, it's not like the coffee machine breaks down. You just call the engineer and you you fix it. You know, people are. They were, we're all different, aren't we? And it's. Um, you have to wear so many hats as a manager, um, yeah. and and what works for one person might not work for another. Um, so it's it, it's. Uh, it's so important but the recruitment bit is is the most important you know if, if you don't get that right then you are absolutely going to be paying for it both in financial terms and and um stress levels <laughs> further down the line definitely and i think there's also a lot um to be said about what you mentioned about like standing out and making yourself attractive this is what I think businesses really miss mm -hmm. in, the, in, in trades because they just assume yeah. that people are going to leave whatever they're doing and they're just going to jump and they should be grateful to have a job. And that works maybe for some, you know, in a, when the market is uh, slow and not competitive, but when you're dealing with an ultra, ultra competitive market, um, and you want the long-term employees, because let's face it, recruitment is expensive. It's very it, expensive if you get it wrong. Very, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the thing, like, <laughs> you know, investing in someone, training them up, onboarding mm. them, 
and mm -hmm. then it doesn't work out in a month or two and you have mm -hmm. to do it all again and rinse and repeat Absolutely. right Absolutely. so it's like that you your your recruitment process and procedures mm -hmm. is a real investment into your business and it's one of those Absolutely. things that if you build the asset and but when i mean asset i mean you know your system and your method that is proprietary to your business in terms of how you recruit your talent. So, you know, what's the job specification? How do you promote it? How do you make it attractive? What's the offer, right? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, what are the benefits? Are there any perks in the yeah, jobs? These the time off, right. things yeah. like that. You know, you need to they should know about that. You know, what's mm -hmm. the marginal, in business, yeah. we call it a marginal utility. What's the marginal utility in terms mm -hmm. of the job application? How do you make it such an attractive, how do you make your business so attractive that people might say, you know what, I'm not just coming from the for the money. I'm actually, I'm coming for the people, the job, yeah. the learning. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. are yeah. you investing yeah. in yeah. development training, certifications? Right all of that yeah, stuff absolutely yeah absolutely. because i think businesses forget to actually you know they, they sometimes i i read in the groups you know um comments about complaining about quality of staff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. they're not reliable but at the flip side it's what about the company what about yeah, the business yeah. owner as well yeah yeah, yeah. Well, it's, a, it's a two as i said it's a two-way process but also um you know if you can make your company more attractive what you'll find is word starts getting around and we're seeing this with some of our clients where we've done some work on the employer what we call the employer branding mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they're starting to get reputations as um, great places to work and they're starting to get people approaching them and that's really where you want to be because the danger of just relying on a job advert is you you know you're only really tapping into the percentage of the market who are looking at that time, which is probably about 10%. And let's face it, some of them will be looking because they're not the right people. And so they're either they're not employed or they're getting heat from their current employer because um, they're not doing a great job. So there's a real risk there. And this was the same, you know, when I was at Starbucks, we were always trying to find the people who weren't looking, who were doing a great job working where they were and and it was about you know getting the message out there right come come to us come to us and yeah. it's absolutely possible to do if anything there's probably more opportunity to do it in this industry than than some it's mm -hmm. not easy it's not that difficult to become attractive and more competitive i think yeah absolutely so th that this is just su such great value i think for whatever your business is mm. Um, this is valuable stuff here. And it, it's amazing that, you know, when you put it all together, this is free content given away from years and years of hands-on experience. So we are coming up to the end. Now, next week, we are going to be covering leadership. Okay, leadership leading the team. So we've taken you through marketing your trades business, lead management, power up of uh, uh, following up and converting those leads, then winning the job, then managing your time so you can make the most of all of the opportunities coming your way and grow your business, and then recruiting the team, which was today's session, and next week, uh, which is our penultimate episode, is gonna be all about leading that team leading excellence, getting the most out of your people. And uh, that will be in about two weeks. It will be two weeks. From I was going to say, I think it's two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to say. Uh, <laughs> two weeks from today. Two weeks, two weeks same, same time. time same I'm just, I've noticed time. We've, um, we've got a couple of people on Zoom. I think I know both of them. I certainly know Neil and I'm pretty sure I saw Chris as well, <laughs> who I used to, I worked with many years ago actually was one of my first trade clients but they're both on mute and they've both turned their cameras off <laughs> yeah we're, we're pretty... i was just wondering if they had any questions that's all yeah i did ask in the chat um oh, looks right. like no one has any questions I've they're not one. very shy either business oh. business is probably booming they have no issues 
problem. No, no, no. Right. Neil has a question. I've, okay, very I've, good. I've just heard. Neil has a I think it's Neil. Is it Neil? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> um, so, like, with my business, for instance, the prices are all pretty much laid out. Mm -hmm. So if I was going to recruit someone, how do I make it appealing to them? Because obviously they're going to be getting paid less so I can make a wage off mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. But surely they'd catch on and be like, oh, hang on, why can't I earn that much, if that makes mm. sense? Because mm. they'll, they'll know the price and structure quite easily and quite quickly. So yeah, it's a really interesting way of looking at it, Neil. I mean, I would say you'll be advertising yeah. and you'll be advertising a certain pay rate. And I think what you're thinking, correct me if I'm wrong, is they'll go, well, I'm being paid this, but you're charging me out at this. But I think yeah. people understand that, well, that's like any business, isn't it? You know, the service is mm -hmm. X. You could take, I don't know, you could take construction, you know, you pay X amount for your extension. And the guys yeah. that are working on the ground know they're not going to get, you know, <laughs> okay. a huge chunk of it. So I think that's part of it. But again, it's yeah. not all about pay. It's, it's probably, I would encourage you to think about um, when you are interviewing, spend as much time asking the person around what it is they're looking for and what's important to them. You know, that's mm. what we cover on the telephone interview is, um, you know, why are you applying for this? What attracted you to apply for it? What would you be looking yeah. for from your next role? What's important to you about the boss that you work for? Because, you know, any relationship is about having that um, discussion up front around expectations. You know, what are you looking for? This is what we're looking for. Is there a fit? Okay. Um, so, so don't worry too much about finance because yes, it's important that people are paid a fair wage, but that's, yeah. it's never the big thing when it comes to in, engagement. It's always up there, but when we do engagement surveys, always number one is, do I know what's expected of me? And am I given feedback as to whether or not I'm doing a good job? So people would actually prefer to know if they're not doing a good job than being left mm -hmm. in the dark. Definitely. Listen, does that apply in the trades? Yeah, absolutely. We've done engagement surveys in the trades and it almost it always comes back to um, expectations and how am I doing? In fact, we developed a whole, um, we changed the structure of one of my clients' business off the back of an engagement survey because people wanted um, to get more involved and they wanted to know how they were doing and play a bigger role in the success of the company so people are people at the end of the day it doesn't really matter what we're selling um, mm. we all want to feel valued we all want to feel yeah. that we're part of something and we all want to see how we contribute to the overall um, goal and there's nothing wrong Neil with you know um, something you might, again what might want to think about I haven't seen your numbers but uh, at some point as you grow something like profit share. So profit share is, as a bonus scheme is very powerful because um, you set your target and you only pay out if you would exceed that target. So let's say you, you say, I'm going to make 10,000 pounds profit in the next quarter and you make 12,000 pounds. Well, uh, you've made your 10, what you wanted to make the 2000, a portion of that goes into a pot and then it's shared out amongst the team that can work very, very well because people can see directly if I work that bit harder and I make the right decisions and I don't waste materials, then the company's more successful and actually I'm going to get a bit of the pie at the end of it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so how does it work with the numbers, Neil? Because um, if you charge, if let's say you charge 50 quid per hour and everybody else charges the same money around an hour. And uh, your uh, your potential employees don't turn up when you advertise thirty quid per hour. What are you gonna do? Because I've got the same problem. <laughs> I've got the same problem. If I I charge two fifty per hour, if I advertise now that I want to employ people for two fifty per hour, I'm I'm gonna have a queue at my door. I'm gonna have two hundred yeah. applications and making no money. When I advertise that I um, uh, want to employ him for 150 per hour, which, which is viable for the business to cover my overheads, etc. I get a few and a poor ones. At this time of the year, probably three in a month or something. Yeah. So Chris, I would say focus on what we've been talking about tonight around it's not just about the money. It's what else can you include in that advertise, um, advertisement that makes it more attractive? Yeah. 
and, and you've got a good team of people, you know, we've known each other a number of years, you've, you've got good people, go and ask them, what is it that makes them stay? Because you're very fair, you're very upfront. I, I would imagine you provide a lot of feedback to your team so they know where they stand and they're invested in. I bet you're doing a lot of good things that um, you, you're perhaps not aware of the impact it has. So, and that's what you want to be calling out in the job advert. You know, it's getting them excited about coming on the journey with you. Um, yes, money's important, but it's not the be all and end all. Yeah. Interesting. I'm going to try that tomorrow. <laughs> I, know I, would like, I would love to also add something here. And maybe this is something that you guys can think about is like your culture, right? Company culture. Um, I know some businesses that take that really seriously in terms of, what they stand for, how they treat employees. They communicate it. It's part of making yourself yeah. attractive. And on the flip side, the most, most businesses that I see, they just ignore it, mm -hmm. right? And they just assume people are gonna wanna work from you. But the reality is that, you know, the marketplace is getting ultra, ultra competitive. Absolutely. Okay, ultra competitive. Yeah. You can't yeah. always be offering the best money right? Okay. But you can be thinking a little bit, and, and this is something that we take really seriously, like from a marketing standpoint, because businesses ask me, oh, Francis, Francis, like, how do we stand out? How do we differentiate yourself? And it always comes back to it. It's not about the offer. It's not about how, you know, chasing to the bottom of the barrel and lowering your prices and that sort of stuff. Actually, it's about elevating your identity, right? And it's elevating who you are and your people and what you stand for, your company values, your mission, who you're serving, your community. Are you, are you, you know, are you giving? Are you getting, but also are you giving? People like that. Do you stand for something? Do you have a business that people want to be a part of? And why do they, why, why should they be a part of it? Yeah. And that's because of that a lot of the times, you know, as the business owner, it's you and your responsibility to have a business that reflects your values, mm -hmm. right? And if it's always just going to be about the transaction, yeah. you're, you're going to get that yeah. back. Like what you give and your ethos, your values, if you value money more than employees, that's the type of employee you're going to get. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right. What you the energy that you give to the universe is like a yeah. slingshot. It's going to give it right back. Yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite. quite. So, I uh, mean, it's a bit like it, about. it's the same with um, customers, isn't it? If you're just if all you if there's no difference between you and a competitor, then it comes down to price. And it's exactly the same with bringing people on board there has to be something that differentiates you it can't just be about the money because people will if you're attracting that sort of person they'll always want more always want more always want more yeah because that's all they're interested in that's all it, that excites them it's more around um there's a great book actually um the buddha and the badass by yeah. um Bishen. Bishen that is a great recommendation a, actually that's, great book yeah. and um yeah. there's an exercise in there that he did where can't remember exactly what he, it's uh, the manifesto isn't it it's the he he basically asked his team you know what do you want and what's important to you and came up with this what they call the manifesto and that forms the the basis of their recruitment advert so they're recruiting people who um are excited about where he's taking the, the company and the journey that he's on i mean he's very very successful now but when he was starting it up in kuala lumpur he couldn't afford to pay much. It was a startup. So he wanted people who were excited about the, the, the journey that he was on and, the, and what he was trying to create. And that's what you're wanting to attract people who are excited about the things that you're excited about and share your values. And that's when you start to define culture. Yeah. Thank Whoa. you. That's very, very good useful. discussion. Insightful, <laughs> yeah. Good, yeah. good. Great good. to be of help. And I hope you gentlemen will join us in two weeks' time at five o'clock for leadership because that's a great transition, right? Uh, uh, recruiting the team, but then you have to keep the team, mm, right? Absolutely. And you have to make it all successful, make it all work. So I, I'm looking forward to that. Allison, you are a star. <laughs> you are my star. 
Thank you so much uh, for Thank today's you very much. session. And we'll see you in two weeks. Will Thanks, do. Everybody. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Okay, bye. bye.